Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm so glad to be here this evening uh, so we can study and read the God's Word. And He's been mighty good to us to give us another day we've had. A, I don't know what part of the country that you're in um, and listening to us tonight, but we're in Cleveland, Ohio. And we had a real bad storm on Tuesday. It's all we can do to get through it. And some people's lights went out. Um, uh, one person that I do know of, um, their house burned down because their lights went out and the poor wife was trying to light some candles to, so she could see. And uh, I don't know if some children knocked it over or someone knocked over a candle and it caught the house on fire. Uh, but the Lord is good. Nobody was hurt. and. They with their uh, daughter right now. We trying to make sure they get all the medications and things they need. Mm -hmm. So we had to keep each other in prayer today, children. We never know what's going to uh, happen from one day to the next. And moment by moment we live. And so we're going to start off with a word of prayer. And I'm, I'm grateful to be here myself. Dear Heavenly Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Lord, we're so thankful that you are our Lord, you are our Savior. You're the King of kings and Lord of lords. And Lord, you gave us all, your very all, because God in heaven allowed you to come down here and die on the cross for our sins, my sins. And then you were resurrected from the grave. And before you ascended into heaven, Heavenly Father, you asked God Almighty to Give your children the Holy Spirit. And we're grateful, Lord, that you've given us the Holy Spirit to comfort us and guide us and counsel us and train us and, and just sanctify us and make us holy and set aside for your purpose, Lord. And we thank you for all these things. We thank you for giving us for our sins, our simple thoughts, our simple actions and giving us another mm -hmm. chance to do better. Every time we wake up, you've given us another opportunity, another day to start afresh to do the things you would have us to do and say. And God, we thank you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Wow. And uh, the title tonight is Seek God's Purpose uh, for Your Life. And we had to do that. You know, on Sunday, the Lord had uh, given me an opportunity to say we must look at ourselves. You know, we had to look in ourselves and see the things God want us to do, you know, to serve his purpose. You know, if there's things in there that we shouldn't be doing, then we had to repent of that. And, and that's not my word, children. Turn to um, Acts the 17th chapter, verse 30, and then we'll get into the lesson here, but um, I'm going to read that. It says, uh, therefore God overlooked and regarded the former ages of ignorance. And see, that's why we had to study his word, so we won't be ignorant. Uh, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. That is to change their own way of thinking, to regret their past sins, and to seize God's purpose for their lives. And see, we don't have to worry about all the sins we have done in the past. If we ask God to forgive them, give us of those sins, then we then that's done. If you sincerely mean that. And then we're supposed to be seeking. Uh, the purpose of whatever God has for us to do for him. But we can't do that if we if our thinking is not right and we're not uh, reading his word because we'll see what the purpose is. If you go to the um, 24th verse in chapter 17, the same chapter. Uh, the 24th verse said, God who created the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, 
does not dwell in temples made with hands. He's not dwelling in all these churches that, you know, people have made and uh, different temples, you know, throughout the world. It says, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. He don't need anything from us. Because it is he who gives all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of lands and territories. It says that was so they could would seek God, and perhaps they might rest for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. He's, he's here with us. It says, for in him we live and move and exist. That is, in him we actually have our being, as even some of our own poets have said, for we also are his children. And so then, being God's children, we should not think that the divine nature, deity, is like gold or silver or stone or an image formed by art or the imagination of skilled man. See, God is uh, our creator. We, we're not the creator. He is. Now turn to um, Romans, the first chapter. Romans, the first chapter. I'm going to uh, look at verse 18 and read the 32. The Lord would have me to do such. I'm going to let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my word be acceptable in our sight. O oh Lord, my Redeemer. Yes, um, He is our Redeemer. Yes, He is. Now it says here, Go up to 16. I am not a, a, ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation from his wrath and punishment to everyone who believes in Christ as Savior, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, both springing from faith and leading to faith, disclosed in a way that awakens more faith. As it, it is written and forever remains written, the just and the upright should live by faith. So you have to have faith that Jesus is Jesus Christ. He is the Lord. He is our Savior. That he did die on the cross for our sins. You have to believe this in your heart and confess with your mouth. And if you believe this, then you, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is with us uh, all the time. He doesn't just uh, come in a room like you hear people say, I feel the Spirit of God in here. He is in you. And He's here to help us. He's here to lead us. He's here to care for us. As, as Jesus said, that's why He wanted us to receive the Holy Spirit. But you cannot receive the Holy Spirit if you do not receive Christ. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as it says in John the 14th chapter, in the 16th verse, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, the comforter, the advocate, the intercessor, counselor, strengthener, and standby to be with you forever. And if you believe that and you, you call on the Lord and you need a counselor in a courtroom, he'll be there. If you're feeling weak and, and distressed and you need to be comforted, he will be there. But many times we do not put our trust in God. And so we go looking for all of that in the wrong places. And so you do not uh, receive comfort. 
uh, you receive a deceiver most of the time. And uh, he will strengthen you when you when you feel weak. And he is with us forever, it says, to be with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive and take to his heart because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he, the Holy Spirit, remains in you continually and will be with you. And Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans, comfortless, bereaved and helpless, and I will come back to you. But in the meantime, he's given us his Holy Spirit to be here with us. Because he knew, uh, and he knows what type of world that we live in that is, uh, is evil. And there's many people down here that are hateful and wicked. And if you go to John the 17th chapter, um, the 15th verse, he says, I do not ask you to take them out of the world. He's talking to God Almighty. You don't ask to take us out of the world, but that you keep them and protect them from the evil one. And they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Set them apart for your purpose. Seek God's purpose for your life. So we're getting sanctified. If you're not already, you're going to be sanctified in the truth, set apart for your purposes, make them holy, and your word is true. And 19 says, for their sake, I sanctify myself to do your will, so they also may be sanctified, set apart and dedicated, made holy in your truth. It says, I do not pray for these alone, it is not for their sake only that I make this request, but also for all those who will ever believe and trust in me through their meshes. He expects us all to give a message about him, about God, so their lives, so they can be saved also. It's not about us. Now turn to Romans, the first chapter. It's not about us, children. It says in uh, verse 18 in the first chapter of Romans, But God does not overlook sin, and the wrath of God is revealed through heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who in their wickedness suppress and strifle, stifle the truth. See, he, our purpose is to give the truth. But these wicked people stifle the truth because that which is Known about God is evident within them in their inner conscience, for God made it evident to them. For ever since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through his workmanship, all his creation, the wonderful things that he has made, so they who fail to believe and trust in him are without excuse and without defense. They don't have no excuse. Turn to Psalms 19. And I'm on the lowest time, and I have to do as he tell me to do. Psalms 19. Uh, verses 1 through 4, it says, The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the expanse of the heaven is declaring the work of his hands. Day after day pours forth speech, and night after night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there spoken words from stars. Their voice is, is not heard. Yet their voice is quite evidence, is quiet evidence, because you can see them. Has gone out through all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In them and in the heavens, he has made 
a tent for the sun. So he's made the stars, he's made the sun, all, all different things. And this is evident, they can see him. They, the, the stars don't have to say nothing. They're there from one end of the earth to the, to the world, all through the universe. And then Ephesians uh, 2.10 states, Yet again, says, as a witness, for we are his workmanship, his own masterwork, a work of art, created in Christ Jesus and reborn from above, spiritually transformed and renewed, ready to be used for good works, which God prepared for us beforehand, taking a path which he set so that we would walk in them living a good life, which he has prearranged and made ready for us. So as we go on through this, you're seeing a, a, the purpose. And it says here in 21, for even though they knew God as a creator, they did not honor him. We do have a purpose. We're supposed to honor God. They did not honor him as God or give thanks for his wondrous creation. On the contrary, they became worthless in their thinking, godless with pointless reasoning and silly speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Claiming to be wise, and they became fools. And exchanged the glory, the majesty, and excellence of a mortal God for an image of worthless idols in the shape of mortal men and birds and four-footed animals and uh, reptiles. And they did this. They even did this in the Old Testament uh, when Moses had led them out of Egypt. They couldn't wait to, to build a golden calf, you know, because they couldn't see God, so they wanted to make themselves an idol to worship before. It says, therefore, God gave them over to gave them over in lusts of their own hearts to sexual impurity so their bodies would be dishonored among them, abandoning them to the degrading power of sin. Because by choice they had exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who blessed them forever. Amen. And they did make four-footed animals and reptiles. They did this. If you look at the Egyptian uh, history, you see all the pyramids and the things and the different things they made. Uh, these idols, you know, throughout, they have them throughout the world, in China and all places. Idols. And they were and it says, for this reason, God gave them over to degrading and vowed passion. Now, it's in, the, it's in, this, in this world today. For their women has changed the natural function for that which is unnatural, a function contrary to nature. This is not the purpose of God. And, um, uh, were consumed with their own desire toward one another. And I'm not talking about nobody. This, this is the word of God. It said, men with men committing shameful acts in return receiving in their own bodies the inedible and appropriate penalty for their wrongdoing. Who verse is that? Uh, 27. Oh. As it says here, in the same way also the men turn away from the natural function of a woman. What it's saying a man is supposed to be with a woman. Uh, he turned away from the natural function of a woman and were consumed with their desire toward one another. Men with men committing shameful acts and received return in return receiving their own bodies the inedible and appropriate penalty for their wrongdoings. 
And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God or consider him worth knowing as their creator, God gave them over to a deprived mind to do which are improper and repulsive. That's not his purpose. The way men are with men and women with women. It says, until they were filled permanently saturated with every kind of unrighteousness and wickedness and greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, mean-spiritedness. And they are gossips. So if you're out there gossiping and doing it, that, that, that's on, all of that is not right. Spreading rumors, slandering haters of God, insolent and arrogant and boastful inventors of new forms of evil, disobedient, disrespectful to parents, without understanding and untrusting, unloving, unmerciful, without pity. Although they know God's righteous decree and his judgment that those who do such acts deserve death. Yet they not only do them, but they even enthusiastically approve and tolerate others who practice them. And we know that to be true because all the different laws have been passed for all those type of things. Now. But that's not seeking God's purpose for your life when we do things that we need to regret and need to repent from. If we say we belong to God, then we need to, you know, act accordingly. And then stay with me in the second chapter here. It says, therefore, you have no excuse or justification. Everyone who, every one of you who hypocritically judges and condemns others. See, he don't want us doing that. Our purpose, again, is that we got to look at ourselves. Look at, your, look at yourself. There's something, including myself, that I need to do better. And my husband even asked me a, a while ago, he said, what's irritating you? You seem like something bothering you. But he didn't know I've been studying this lesson through the week. And uh, the Lord working on me too. You know, it don't have to be anything that's read on that list, but some kind of way, everyone, there's not one good up on this earth. The only one who was good enough that had not sinned was Jesus Christ. And see, God's purpose for us is to, to seek him and to repent of the ways we're not doing right. We're supposed to love one another and seek the best for one another. That's what we're here for. And to give the word so people can become saved. We're supposed to be given a message. And sometimes the message that we're given may not be that at all. It'd be about ourselves. It'd be about what we want. And what we're supposed to be doing is uh, seeing about what God wants. And not judging and condemning other people. As it says here in the first chapter, it says, For in passing judgment on one another, you condemn yourself. Because you who judge from a position of arrogance and self-righteousness are habitually practicing the same thing which you denounce. So we have to be careful, brothers and sisters. And it says, and we know that the judgment of God falls justly and in accordance with truth on those who practice such things. It says, but do you think this, O oh man, when you judge and condemn those who practice such things and yet do the same yourself that you will escape God's judgment and elude his verdict? Oh, it says, or do you have no regard for the wealth of his kindness? God is kind to us, and he is tolerant. Said, and, and tolerance and patience, withholding his wrath, and 
he does. We could all be dead now. But he's constantly showing us how we need to, to change. But he's not going to make us do it. It says, are you actually unaware or ignorant of the fact that God's kindness leads you to repentance? That is to change your inner mind, your old way of thinking. Seek his purpose for your life. There it is again. Because, mm-hmm. Can you elaborate or seek his purpose for your life? That means that we got to get right, right? Right. That's why I was irritated. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, you think you humble, and you already did uh, so much that, you know, what else could I possibly have to do? <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot. And he gets to talking with you during the day and through the night. You know, every time I get ready to do something, do it this way, do it that way. And I find myself truly, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm full of the Holy Spirit. I find myself not just being led all day long. I've been getting ready to do something one way, and the Holy Spirit said, no, not that way. And I'll tell you uh, maybe why I got a little irritated, because I've been doing things my way a long time. Now, you know, when the Holy Spirit is directing me, seeing like I'm getting, I'm, I, I had to be told everything what to do. What's the mind reader? And uh, our so I'm, I'm are, being late. Our, we have been brought up in a world of unbelief all, right. all around us for so many years. So many years. And now that you realize that you're a spiritual being, right. and the Holy Spirit is in you, and now that you're listening to him, there is a whole lot. It's a whole lot. That we haven't been doing right. And, and that's, uh, what, that's, what, that's why you get a little aggravated, because you think you've been doing it. I thought I was doing it right. Now, at the same time, I'm happy that the Holy Spirit is showing me these things. Mm -hmm. But uh, God has been very patient with me, and I know he's been patient one, with you. One reason why the Holy Spirit is showing us stuff, because we live in a dangerous world. Right, that's what he's telling me. This is a dangerous it's world. It's dangerous, and if I'm going in the wrong direction, it, it can mean my life. And uh, since I'm so... Well, uh, cut your days short. Yeah, the days will be cut short. And see, God has a purpose for me as well as you. And so he wants us to uh, be led by his spirit so we can do what he tells us to do. Because, you know, time is winding up. And uh, as I was studying and reading, uh, we got to give account for all the time we've been here. We got to give account of ourselves. And when we go, a lot of people say, well, uh, we, came, we came here butt naked, we're going to leave naked. No, what you're going to leave with is the, the deeds you Your have works. done. Your works, deeds, or whatever you've done. Whatever good you've done is going to go with you, and whatever bad you have done is going to go with you. So God is saying we need to uh, repent. Uh, is it saying here? I'm going to finish reading this. You know he's talking to saints. Yes, he's talking to all that this I read. That's about he's the saints. He's talking to saints. Right. Do you know saints is actually doing this? Yes, I Men are with men, I and women are with women. This is actually going on in the church. It, yeah. And that's why a lot of these have been passed. It's not only in the churches, it's in the politicians and everything. And world. the judges. It's in the world. It's in the world. Because I'm going to tell you, these laws never would have been approved if the, the higher ups wasn't, you know, into this. So all of this is going on right now. But God is not pleased with us, and he wants us to seek his purpose. What's more in this going on? It is. I'm just going by what the Holy Spirit. Now, I done told you. I'm going by the way the Holy Spirit done told me uh, what to do here today. And it says uh, in the fourth verse, Oh, do not have no regard for the wealth of his kindness or tolerance and patience in withholding his wrath. Are you actually unaware or ignorant of the fact that God's kindness leads you to repentance? And it does because... When the Holy Spirit has shown me these things, see, I don't want to do anything to disappoint my Lord and Savior. I don't know about you, but I want to please God. 
And so um, when you want to please God, then you, you will repent. And I'm going to tell you, the Holy Spirit is not going to tell you to do anything wrong. He only tells us what to do what God tells him to do. He only tells us what to say that God tells us to say because the Holy Spirit reverences God. He, he doesn't step over his bound or anything. And that's why I need to be led. It says um, that is to change your inner self, your old way of thinking. Seek his purpose for your life. And it says, because of your callous stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are deliberately storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So um, he's trying to help all his children do right. Mm -hmm. So we have to repent because we will pay for it. It says he will pay back each person. That's the sixth verse, so you can get there. If you're not there now, Romans second chapter, sixth verse. He will pay back to each person according to his deeds. Justly as his deeds deserve. The judge. Right. To those who by persistence in doing good seek unconcerned. Wait, excuse me. To those who by persistence in doing good seek unseen but certain heavenly glory, honor, and immortality, he will give the gift of eternal life. So I don't know about, about y'all, but that's what, um, what I'm doing. But the guidance of the Holy Spirit, now I'm, that's what I'm doing through the, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I can't do it on my own. I'm not going to say that. I can't do nothing on my own but fail. That's what I do. And it says, but for those who are, un are selfishly ambitious and self-seeking and disobedient to the truth, but responsive to wickedness, see, they respond to the wickedness. They will be wrath and indignation. There will be tribulation and anguish, torturing and confinement for every human soul who does or permits evil to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But glory and honor and the inner peace will be given to everyone who habitually does good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But God shows no partiality no arbitrary favoritism with him one person is not more important than another it says for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without regard to the law and all who have sinned under the law will be judged and condemned by the law for it is not those who merely hear the law as it is read aloud, who are just and righteous before God. But it is those who actually obey the law who will be justified and pronounced free of guilt of sin and declared acceptable to him. It says, when the Gentiles who do not have the law, since it was given only to the Jews, do instinctively the things the law requires, guided only by their conscience. They are a law to themselves, though they do not have the law. They show that the essential requirement of the law are written in their hearts and in their conscience, their sense of right and wrong, their moral choices, bearing witness in their thoughts, alternately, alternatingly, Alternative, yeah, alternatively accusing or perhaps defending them. It says on that day when, as my gospel proclaims, God will judge the secret. This is what got to me. I might as well tell the truth. This verse got to me. Um, Romans, the second chapter, verse 16. 
It says on that day as my gospel proclaims God would judge the secrets, all the hidden thoughts and concealed sins of men through Christ Jesus. So when you see something like that, you 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 start searching and seeking. <clears throat> Am I really doing what God wants me to do? It, you know, is this the purpose? Am I serving him um, in all the things I do and all the things I say? Purpose for your life. Purpose for my life. Because uh, God loves us children. He really does. Now turn to Ephesians, the second chapter. To Ephesians, the second chapter. And we're talking about Christ in this chapter also. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a whole lot there in that. Not that you're going to be innocent. Yeah, I am going to be innocent. Yeah, I'm going to end soon. It says here, um, And you, he made made alive the uh, first, uh, first verse in chapter 2 of Ephesians. It says, And you, he made alive when you were spiritually dead. See, we were all spiritually dead until we accepted Christ. And separated from him because of your transgressions and sins. In which you once walked. See, we don't have to sin now. He has the Holy Spirit within us. He's here for us. And if we listen to the Holy Spirit and be guided by him, you know, being obedient, we will not be sinning. It says, in which you once walked, you were following the ways of the world, as the pastor said, influenced by this present age in accordance with the prince of power of air, Satan. The spirit who is now at work in the disobedient, the unbelieving, who fight against the purposes. There it is again of God. God wants us all to receive eternal life. And he wants us to reverence him and to glorify him. We're supposed to be praising God and not worshiping idols and things. And it says, among unbelievers, we all once lived in the passion of our flesh. Our behavior governed by sinful self, indulging the desires of the human nature without the Holy Spirit. See, we didn't have them then. And the impulses of a sinful mind, we were by nature children under the sentence of God's wrath. Just like the rest of mankind. See, he's talking to the believers, as you said. Oh, yeah. The whole Bible, you yeah, know. The epistles are to believers. Right, to believers. Church and and, and he's trying to let us know we don't have to act like this. And it says, but God, being so very rich in mercy, see, he's merciful because of his great and wonderful love with which he loved us. Even when we were spiritually dead and separated from him because of our sins, he made us spiritually alive together with Christ. For by his grace, his undeserved favor and mercy, you have been saved from God's judgment. And he raised us up together with him. When we believed, it said, when we believed, and seated us with him in the heavenly places because we are in Christ Jesus. So Jesus is sitting up in heaven. And believe it or not, our spirit is sitting up there with him too. But see, we don't know it. If you don't read and study and the scripture and, and read about the Holy Spirit and Christ and God, you don't you think you just this is all there is, and it isn't. There's more to come, and he is going to return for his children. And we will have to give account of ourselves to the Lord. 
And if we're not going to be able to say, well, Lord, I just couldn't do it. I didn't have enough strength. He's going to say, well, the Holy Spirit was with you. What you mean you didn't have no strength? Where he is, I am. And it says, um, and he did this so that in the ages to come, he might clearly show the immeasurable and unsurprised riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus by providing our redemption. It says, for it is by grace God's remarkable compassion and favor drawing you to Christ that you have been saved and actually delivered from judgment and given eternal life through faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves, not through your own effort. That's why I said it's nothing I can do to, to get it. It's not through our own effort, but it is the undeserved and gracious gift of God. Not as a result of your works, nor your attempt to keep the law, so that no one will be able to boast or take credit in any way for his salvation. For we are his workmanship, his own masterwork, work of art, created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, ready to be used. See, we're supposed to be used by God for good works. That's the purpose. For good works, which God prepared for us beforehand, taking the path which he said. Now, we can't take that path if we don't follow the Holy Spirit. So that we would walk in them. How are you going to walk in them if you're not led by the Spirit of God? It says, living a good life, which he prearranged and made ready for us. See, we can't even have a good life. That's why so many are poor and don't have nothing. Because they're not being led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would not have you begging for bread and not have you clothes or nowhere to lay your head. Not God's children, that we his children. But if we led by other ways, this world which is ran by Satan, you can expect to be poor. You can expect to be sick. You can expect to be needy. Begging. But if you're a child of the king, you're going to be treated like that. You're going to be treated like his children. He's not going to give you a rock to eat when you need some bread. He's not going to give you a, a snake to eat when you want a little meat to eat or some fish. He's going to give you what you need. When the children were out there in the wilderness and didn't have water, he was able to, to uh, have Moses get water from a rock and tell you the rock is Jesus Christ. So we need to listen. And you read these chapters over. Uh, read the chapters over. It says, therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles, we were considered the Gentiles. If you wasn't Jewish, you were considered a Gentile. By birth, who are called uncircumcision. By those who call themselves circumcision. Uh, itself a mere mark which is made in the flesh by human hands. And human hands did that. And you have a baby that's circumcised, a surgeon does that today. Uh, it says, remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from any relationship with him, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and the strangers, to the covenants of promise with no share in the sacred messianic uh, promise and without knowledge of God's agreement, having no hope in his promise and living in the world without God. See, that's what we, we had before Christ came. But now, at this very moment in Christ Jesus, you who once were so far away from God have been bought near by the blood of Christ. 
for he himself is our peace and our bond of unity. He who made both groups, Jews and Gentiles, into one body and broke down the barriers, the dividing wall of the spiritual antagonism between us by abolishing his own crucified flesh, the hostility caused by the law with his commandments contained in audiences which he satisfied so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thereby establishing peace, and that he might reconcile them both, Jew and Gentile, united in one body to God through the cross, thereby putting to death the hostility. And he came and preached the good news of peace to you, Gentiles who were far away, and peace to those Jews who were near. For it's through him that we both have the great way of approach in the one spirit to God. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens outside without rights of citizenship, that you are fellow citizens with the saints of God's people and are members of God's household having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, the Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone in whom the whole structure is joined together and continues to increase, growing in, in the holy temple in the Lord, a sanctified, a sanctuary dedicated, set apart and sacred to the uh, presence of the Lord in him and in fellowship with one another you also are being built together in dwelling place of God in the spirit. And his purpose for us is to turn from our ways that we have of this world and to seek him and to allow his Holy Spirit to guard us. And I thank you all for listening. I hope you was able to get something out of this. I know you did. It's not getting something out of it. I hope you received the word tonight. And I'm going to close us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Lord, I'm just uh, grateful that you allowed me to have this time to talk to your children. And I, hope, and I pray that they are, their hearts have been changed and their minds have been renewed and, and they're ready to seek the purpose that you have for them. And I thank you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen.